So today I wanted to do some of the things I promised. One is I wanted to put some questions on the table that came from the audience. Um, and uh, then try to look at the, the relationship between Graham's, or try to unfold his understanding of what is aesthetics and what we, I don't mean to define aesthetics, but why is aesthetics a topic he um, holds as a significant catalog and category of thinking about art in relationship to alternatives like like sensoria, um, and so those are, and that'll let me introduce it. And then at the end of it, just for some titillation, I'm going to make you watch some advanced astronomy, uh, which I think you'll enjoy. Um, anyway, one of the questions that came in is about, and this came from a student, why what you meant by the re. Well, let me just ask you first. How did you feel about the conversation with Slavoj? I thought it was fine. I mean, you're, you're never going to have an even distribution of words spoken in a conversation with Slavoj, so I knew I'd be doing a lot of listening. But that's fine. It was just a, it was a pleasure to sit on the same stage with someone I've admired for a long time. And he's very funny to listen to. Um, if you watch enough football games, you realize that lots of times time of possession doesn't equal a win. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I, you know, I was very impressed with your, uh, I wouldn't, uh, your ability just to to manage that hysteria, um, even though he cut you off at the key moments of answering all the key questions. And some of those, I'm going to get you, try to get you to answer today. Um, one of the students asked about the problem of enchantment and reenchantment and disenchantment and. If you remember, early in Graham's, or even if you don't remember, let me say to you, early in Graham's conversation with Slavoj, it was a, quite a salvo he threw when he said, you know, one of the big differences between you and me and, uh, uh, was it Bedju? You mentioned someone over, Ma Probably Marison, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. That is, these thinkers are thinking that the world hungers for re-enchantment whereas his body of work shows that the world is always already enchanted and even the disenchantment that we think we're in today is a form of enchantment, if mm -hmm. I understood that correctly. And the student really wanted to know what that meant, what, we, what you were talking about, and didn't know Max Weber, Weber and are not really products of the 20th century post nuclear post-Holocaust um, period of existential anxiety, which then turned into a period of existential comedy, like, let's say with Beckett. You know, so you, you have this existentialism that grows out of the, law, the complete disenchantment, which then re-enchants itself in a certain way. And so I just thought I'd ask you to speak a little bit to that, because it was a fantastic moment, I thought, in the talk. This comes from Zizek's critical essay on Triple O, which is all on Levi Bryant. Um, and he accuses Bryant in there of being on the side of Bruno Latour's re-enchantment of nature. But Latour's pretty clear he's not in favor of re-enchantment of nature. He, Latour thinks there never was a modernity. There was yes. never any radical cut where the subject became separated from the world and therefore purified and therefore we gave to nature what was nature's and to the subject what was subject's. Uh, was the subject's. Latour thinks that there's always been enchantment. People who claim that they're disenchanted or no longer naive, are themselves naive in a new way. And it's funny to me in some ways that uh, Zizek didn't acknowledge this because Zizek realizes this on other fronts. Clearly, uh, yes. No question about it. Yes, as clearly as, as Latour at least. For example, uh, Zizek says in one place that um, you know, we don't believe in the news anymore, but we believe in conspiracy theories. So there's always a new kind of naivete that takes the place of the old one. And there was another one he said, oh yeah, one of my funniest Zizek stories I can't remember which book this is. Zizek talks about watching a documentary about neo-Nazi skinheads in Germany, in which the interviewer asked the neo-Nazis, why, why are you a Nazi? And he expected some kind of racist outburst, explaining why. And he, the guy, the, the neo-Nazi said, I'm a, I'm a skinhead because of the breakdown of paternal authority and diminishing upward mobility. <laughs> so he's talking like a sociologist, yeah. talking from the objective, detached position, and yet he is still a Nazi. He is still wrapped up in his Nazism, still acting accordingly. 
So it's not as if that critical distance or the cynicism about what you're doing absolves you of the naivete of doing it. And he's, he also talks often about how in, in communist countries, cynicism about the game was part of the game, right? So the, the people who were going along with the communist system will make the most obscene jokes about the system, and yet nonetheless they were part of it. Yes. So there's no escaping enchant enchantment, really. Yes, uh, I would say what we have to do is, you know, it, sometimes you want to blame it on the word. I think the word enchantment is fine. Mm -hmm. um, what we have to do is remove the occult implications of enchantment. In other words, the world, the world is enchanting primarily because there are no occult forces other than the reality of the occult forces that are real. Mm -hmm. um, so, by the way, this is a small audience, and this is good, and that gives you a chance to interrupt at any time. Like it's, at this point, we're taking up a conversation uh, based on questions from the audience, and so if there's anything he's talking about or I'm talking about or any author that you would like to know why we're mentioning them or who they are, just stop and interrupt us, okay? All right, go to, ahead. To respond to your last point, yes, I'm not advocating that we go back to a medieval period of pixies, nymphs, and water sprites, and belief in occult forces. No? Oh, you ruined but, my whole but, talk. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, a lot of people tend to view science as a matter of believing in less, right? It's replacing gullible belief, or destroying gullible belief. Uh, Ray Brassier is kind of like this, former speculative realist who thinks knowledge is a form of nihilism, that it's about believing in less. It's actually not. I, I'd say we believe in a lot more than animals do. I can believe in all sorts of things about stars that animals have never heard of, and uh, every branch of science populates the world with even more entities that no one believed in before, but that now we have to believe in because they've been discovered. And so in a way, it's, uh, history is more of an, about an increase in naivete, an increase in belief than decrease, I would say. Mm -hmm. Even if we're getting rid of certain gods and magic spells and occult qualities, we're still replacing them with something else, I think. Good, so this is, uh, I keep wanting to explain this to Graham and I was gonna read this email I sent to him and maybe to you is, I'm not here at all to yet debate Graham. Uh, I'm here because I wanna understand his work better and because there's a deep resonance some, to some of his conclusions in mine, even though there's a fundamental antagonism based on notions of matter and materiality, which I hope we're going to explore at the end. But um, I'm now going to put f locate a moment in your talk with Slavoj, which sounds like a discussion of a fundamental break that occurred in mid-modernity, which fundamentally changed the status of two kinds of objects. Um, and that was when you said, so again, I'm not holding you hostage. You could say, should I, did I say that? I didn't mean that, that'd be fine with me. Or I meant that yesterday. This is what I say, yes, I meant that yesterday. And I mean it today when I don't believe that anymore. And I think both of those are true. So, I mean, so you can use all those kinds of rhetorical tricks. But in a really wonderful moment, you say, shh, no more clicking. Float, levitate, please. <laughs> I know, I, I always wanted to be a stand-up comic. Who did I, how did I ever figure out that I am a stand-up comic, but I'll make about 10 times as much as the, even the most famous stand-up comics in the world until they make movies, so I made the right choice. Um, you said, art and architecture require an audience. After the nuclear holocaust, there could be no more, there could be no such thing anymore as art, maybe art as such or architecture as such. And at that moment, I'm thinking to myself, first of all, that seems in conflict with the no modernity, no fundamental epochal shift, um, and also seems also to drift very much back towards the uh, actor's network position that the only reason that there's art and architecture in a philosophical and political sense is because of the effects that come out of its relationship in transactions. So I was going to ask you to unfold that a little bit for me. Yeah. This has been a concern of mine in the last few years. It came out of my reading of Michael Fried and my agreements and disagreements with his great essay, Arts and Objecthoods, 
where, of course, I don't know how fresh that essay is in everyone's memory. You probably all read it at some point. He's, he's critiquing primarily the minimalists. The essay's from 1967. And Freed accuses the minimalists of both literalism and theatricality. And the literalism critique, I go along with Freed. Mm -hmm. This idea that and, and whether or not he's right about the minimalists is a separate question. But let's assume he's right about the minimalists, that all that's there is what you see is what you get. All you get is the white cube and the long wooden rod, and there's nothing more to it than that. Therefore, it's just literal. There's no depth beyond the surface properties of the thing. And of course, I have to agree with Freed on this. As an object-oriented ontologist, for me, the, what withdraws behind the surface configurations and the appearance is always more real than the... But this is also what the minimalists, at least in a certain group of them, were after. Like Robert yeah. Morris and yeah, I'm not, not sure Carl that. Andre. Let, let's say not Carl Andre and not the the wood guy, the flat stuff on the floor. Right. Um, Who? Judd. No, no. Judd is even worse. Judd is just a fraud. Uh, no, Carl Andre is the guy who murdered his wife. So that's the guy. So, but there were they were in they had a more theological attitude about their minimalism. But some of the real industrial minimalists, and I think Robert Morris is probably the most obvious Judd in certain aspects um, are exactly like you're saying. They, they, they want an abject presence of the work without no, res, no right. subtext. But whether or not he's right about interpreting the minimalists, I endorse his criticism of literalism, but reject his criticism of theatricality, which he thinks is the same thing as literalism, because yes. he, he thinks that since the work is nothing more than a literal surface, its whole point must be in order to jar us and get some reaction out of us, which he says is the death of art. And I decided that I don't think it's the death of art, and I decided that theatricality is actually the opposite of literalism, um, in the sense that just as water has hydrogen and oxygen as ingredients, art has the work in humans as ingredients. Because if the humans were to disappear, you just have physical materials. It wouldn't really be an art relation. Now, that might sound, I agree, it might sound like I'm slipping back to a correlationist position or a position where humans have to be involved in everything or it's not real. Right. But I don't think so, and here's why. Let me first mention an idea that, that Manuel Delanda has in his book, The New Philosophy of Society. Delanda starts that book by saying, this book is going to be a realist philosophy of society, which means a philosophy of society apart from how we think of it. And people might say, that's crazy. How can you have a society without humans? Because without the humans, there would be no society. He says, yes, that's true. Humans are necessary ingredients of society, but that does not mean that society is not beyond our human conception of it. Regardless of the fact that we are the ingredients of it, society itself has aspects that transcend any human understanding of it, and this is why sociology is not finished. We never fully understand uh, what's there in the object. And then in my book on Dante, Dante's Broken Hammer, where the first half is kind of a summary of the Divine Comedy and La Vita Nuova, the second half is where I talk about formalism, which has a you know, very specific meaning in architecture and some other fields. I was using it in Kant's sense. Now, the only place Kant actually uses the term formalism is in his ethics. And what it primarily means there is autonomy. Mm. This is great, isn't it? Yeah. Typical Sayoc, skateboard. But you understand, that is our subject matter. Yeah. So the, re the reason that it happens is that that was an event, and that's yeah. a post-programmatic event. And so we encourage that annoyance. So, of course, what's key for ethics for Kant is that ethics has to be self-contained. It has to be autonomous. Ethics cannot be about rewards or punishments. And so if you're good because you want to go to heaven or you don't want to go to hell or because you want a good reputation or any of these other motivations, that's not an ethical motivation. Ethics requires, among other things, that an action is performed for its own sake, not because of any consequences. And so famously, you could never lie, according to Kant. There's no situation that justifies lying, even if it involves hiding a family from the SS. Um, so ethics is formalist in the sense that it should all be on the side of us and not at all on the side of the object. So this is what we might call today the equivalent of legal formalism. It doesn't matter if you're innocent or guilty. There is a formalism in place, and its, self, uh, its autonomy is independent of its substantive conclusions. That sounds right to me, although formalism is altered a bit in each field in which it's brought. Yes, that's, so I, I, that's what we're going to try to do a little bit. And then uh, in his aesthetics, where he doesn't use the word formalism, but it's there, right? He's obviously in some ways the founder of modern art there. He says that uh, beauty is on our side of the equation. It's not really on the object. Beauty mm -hmm. has to do with the fact that we all share the same transcendental faculty of judgment. And therefore, even if we don't all expect each other to like the same food as I like, 
we should expect each, all of us to like the same art as each other if our taste is sufficiently developed, the best taste should all agree over time. Okay. So it's, it's on the side of our mind, it's not on the side of the object. And even the sublime, he says, is on the side of our mind, not the side of the object, because it's about the sublime overwhelming us with its size or its power, its infinite size or power compared to us. So it's, everything's happening on our side of the fence. The interesting thing is that Greenberg and Freed, who are considered the two art critics working most in Kant's tradition, flip that around where they're trying to detach the human part of it. It's about the object. So that for Freed, he's trying to get rid of theatricality because he doesn't want humans contaminating the artwork. And in Greenberg's case, it's because um, he doesn't think it has anything to do with the transcendental faculty of judgment. It has to do with everyone experiencing the artworks themselves and reaching a consensus. So in a way, he's, those two are flipping kind of upside down, but it's still formalism in both the good and the bad sense. Mm -hmm. Because if there's a side of formalism that I like, it's the idea of autonomy. It's that a, a, a work, and that includes an architecture as well as the arts, has value apart from its socio-political effects, apart from its environmental impact. So I agree with that part. What I don't like about Kant's formalism is the idea that formalism also means the specific detachment from human and world. So that these two ingredients are two preciously different things that can never be combined without contaminating each other. Whereas I think a human world's combination can also have an autonomy from everything that's outside of it. And as a separate object. As if a separate com combined object. Human and object can make a new object just like hydrogen and oxygen can make water. And Human water is not a, co not a composite object of, uh, I'm, I'm only elucidating. No. So, yeah. so that you would never, even if I do not want to endorse the notion of emergence, which we will discuss about, hydrogen and oxygen are not the um, ingredients of water. Water becomes water in a new object, and there's a monadic, let's say, irreducibility to water that doesn't make it a compound object of, um, are y'all following this? I just trying to make sure. I think this is very important. Yeah. It's gonna be super important later on. So humans really have two different roles. We are both the ingredients and the observers in any situation, or we can be ingredients and observers in the same situation. So in the case of ethics, what's the best critique of Kant's ethics so far? I, I think it's Max Scheler the colorful, he was kind of the Zizek of his day, a colorful yeah, no. German philosopher, yeah. kind of scandal-ridden lifestyle in the 1920s, uh, and right after World War I. And his argument against Kant's ethics, which he respects, and he says we can't go to a pre-Kantian ethics because autonomy and formalism are important, but ethical, people have individual ethical vocations that involve the object. So it can't just be a universal rule that's applicable to everyone. It's that the Italians have a certain ethical vocation for such and such, and uh, architecture professors, such and such. Um, the object of your passion is always part of the object of ethics as well, and there's a different ethical imperative for each person based on who they are and what their destiny is and what their career is like and what their life has been like. And so the ethical unit for Shaler is not me. It's me plus the world. That's the ethical unit. And if I don't respond to the world in the proper way according to the specific situation I'm in or my specific life, it's not an ethical act. Mm -hmm. It cannot be formalized in Kant's right. sense of getting the object out of it. That's right. And, and then arts. Yeah, I, I think that's, yeah, please. Just, I was just gonna continue the point yeah. with arts. Freed thinks the, the human element has to be removed, otherwise the formalism is gone. It's no longer autonomous. Yes. I, don't, I think he's mixing two things together. I would agree with the formalist art critics that you don't wanna get the artwork too entangled in social political contexts and everything because then you are losing the autonomy. I don't think you totally exclude that. I think some artworks are not understandable without that, for example, Guernica or Uncle Tom's Cabin, there are certain artworks that... Yeah, you always do. pick a pretty good painting and a sucky ass. Do you, those two books well, of yours. <laughs> but it's Why don't you use what Kant uses, and that is, or the American version of what Kant would say, which is, you can't judge the aesthetics of the White House because you're too, you're too politically involved in it. So you don't, you'll never know if the White House is a good building as a work of art because it's too important politically and symbolically. Same thing you're doing he was, with- He was talking about Frederick the Great's palace. Right? Yes, that's okay. right. Right, but- um, I, Basically, uh, I can't remember a long, long ago, so I can- <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how sucky ass Uncle Tom's Cabin is. It's usually ranked in the top 100 greatest novels of all time. Yeah, maybe, because, of maybe, his, because of his political fame, yeah. the writing just sucks. Well, we can talk about that later, but-, but Oh, um, what was her? Oh, what was the slave's name? Oh, that one passage about- I don't remember. Simon Legree is chasing, mm. what's her name? And, she stops and basically says, oh, you know, I don't want to be a slave. I don't know if you remember all this. I don't remember that. Oh, but, I've but, never seen, done with seeing the movie version anyway. So I see. That's where this comes from. I mean, the point being that, that, that I wouldn't want to say that all environmental aspects are included. It's just that 
from the fact that some are included, like the political, the political connotations of Guernica, does not follow that there's a holistic free-for-all where everything's connected to everything else and everything determines everything else and everything of the same era comes in and affects the work. There are barriers between a work and most of its surroundings. It lets them in selectively. But uh, as far as Kant and the artwork, I was going to say that, again, the, the aesthetic unit is not either just my transcendental faculty of judgment, like for Kant, or just the object, like for Greenberg and Fried, but me plus the object is the unit. And it's still a formalist autonomous unit because yes. there's a reality to the specific way I react to a certain artwork or a building that is different from how other people do it. Now, this is better known in literature because of reader response theory. There's been this whole school trying right. to take this into account. But uh, just as with ethics, I would say certain people have certain aesthetic vocations. And one of the ways I try to look at this is it's often interesting to look at various artists, whether in the visual arts or literature, and ask who were their major influences who are not considered great artists? Because you can learn a lot from them. And the example I always think of is T.S. Eliot and Jules Lafargue, who was a huge impact on Eliot, but was not really one of the greatest French poets of the late 1800s. But there was something about him that got something going in Eliot. Eliot had the vocation to see something there. Uh, and I, I, this was philosophers, too. Who were the major influences on any philosopher who are not really great philosophers? In my interview of Mayasu, I asked him that as well. And I, I think he said the... Schlegel. No, he's... He, well, there were two times I asked this. And one of them, he said, it's those people between Kahn and Hegel, like, uh, like yeah. Jacobi and Schilling? Beck and Reinhold. That whole Jena school that was... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then another time, he said the situationists. And when I asked for contemporary examples, he said the situationists and somebody else. So you can learn a lot from not, people. They were not great philosophers. No, whereas everybody who studies philosophy is influenced by Plato and Aristotle and Kant and Hegel and uh, to some Hegel, extent. De Boer, you would not say. Oh, he's fine, but he's not at the level of Heidegger or, yeah, or but, Hegel. Uh, yeah, I do That's, think, you know, of course he's not. Um, I'm surprised you included Hegel, but. Um, really? No, I, mean, I, don't, I don't agree with Hegel, but he's obviously got a big Hegel. brain on his shoulders. Yeah. Well, actually, I don't know if he's got a good brain. Right? You, know, you know, he spent most of his days playing pool and only wrote at night. 12 hours a day, he would play pool. Well, it's more than Darwin wrote every day. What, four hours a day? Yeah, but I mean, you know, he was English, for God's sake. Right. It's amazing that we care anything at all about Darwin. I'm, yeah, I love what you say about Darwin. I'm going to ask you a couple quick questions. Just, I don't mean this to be a discussion of Kant. Um, I don't care if you know who Kant is or not. Um, I once put a, an aphorism that says, uh, do you know that I wrote an article about 20 years ago called Towards an Objectology. And that that was laying out my view that an object-based view of the world was the thing missing from uh, flow theory or, you know, the, the, and I don't know if you know this, you don't know this, do you? If it was in a question of qualities, then I read it. If it's not, then no, I No, I, I could see the funny thing about that book is I had nothing to do with the production of that book. People assembled your essays. And I don't even know what's in it. Oh, you don't know what's in it. In fact, I'm afraid to find out what's in it. Oh. But anyway, this is just a set of aphorisms and observations to lay out the fact that, um, that the apparent undoing of the noun in deconstruction was not possible, and in Good. fact, even Derrida himself knew that the con, the con in the deconstruction is that the moment you undo a noun, another noun forms. Mm -hmm. And so that's the always already passing of the trace. So you'll never find this moment of abject intermediacy or abject non-objectivity. And even all of his examples require, for example, when he says writing it's not a picture of speech because each word, in, when you write it down, has a space between it, and we don't talk like this. Mm -hmm. so, that, you know, so he's very careful, I think. Uh, and I was, but in Kant and in the third critique, and this we won't do this for much long. What he says in the in the first two critiques, and particularly in uh, pure reason, is that um, pure reason demands universal assent. Categorical, categorical imperative. And that's why the synthetic a priori, two things that have to pre-exist for, for reason to occur are space and time, and that these are not real in the world. These are structures that we bring to the world. And so, and then when he gets to the third critique, and I'm, I'm not the expert, so I'm just telling you my reading of this. And the third critique, when he wants to bridge practical reason and pure reason with uh, aesthetic judgment, he, pu he puts forward the notion of beauty as if it were a synthetic a priori, mm -hmm. but he ameliorates its position by saying, in, 
in the German it trans more, translate not that an aesthetic judgment expects universal assent, but that it expects general assent. And there's a subtle difference there, I think, between the ethics argument and the aesthetic argument. Uh, and so his is a formalism, um, but it's presented entirely as a form. In other words, he doesn't say, he doesn't find a position for formalism in his aesthetic philosophy. He puts forward a profound formalism as the aesthetic philosophy. So the reason it doesn't occur there in the word, as a word, is it is a formulation. You know, he doesn't say, here's a formalism. Here's, he's saying, here's the formalism. That's what I would, you know, so the difference between the general ascent and the uh, beauty, and that, because he was either that or he was totally, you would have him be totally naive and ignorant about people's, not only differences in taste, but differences in cultural taste. And he was a well-traveled and well, I mean, even though he walked up and down one path for 10 years. Uh, he was well read, that say, not very well-traveled. Right, well, he did stop uh, his walks for three days to read Rousseau, which I think. So you could set your clock by clock until one book got published. Um, I would assume that the difference between general and universal assent is simply that um, Kant wants to assume a certain ethical understanding among all, all humans, whereas you can't really make that case for right. the fine arts. You no, need a certain I, degree of taste and culture that yeah. you don't need to be ethical. And I think what, what's important, uh, that very, becomes very important for us in our understanding because it allows, for example, for differences in skill and talent on taste. Uh, It'll explain why certain artists can be better than others, and you know, I mean, I think it's a really important insight. Anyway, I don't mean to belabor that. The the question of the formalisms, however, and you were really um, you're correct about this is there's lots of kinds of formalisms, um, and the aesthetics uh, and ethics is one of the most important in judicial. The formalism of judicial practice is why if you're convicted of a crime and you can prove yourself innocent, it doesn't overturn your conviction. So it is a premise of formalist law that the rules of law are followed and the conclusions of the process are self-adjudicating and do not contain a substanti uh, do not contain a p component of substantive interpretation. Whereas, for example, in Chinese law, it's exactly the opposite, the same person will be asked to adjudicate a case and that person will be in charge of both the defense and the prosecution and they will only make the adjudication based on substantive, what were the actual circumstances? Was the guy hungry or not? So it didn't matter did he steal or not, it's was he hungry, did he need to feed his wife, was it, you know, and so Chinese law and other forms of non-Western law don't have a totally different formalist tradition. That's one kind of formalism. The kind of formalisms that you talk about, that we talk about, that Clement Greenberg and Fried were talking about, I think it's important also to notice one thing. Aristotle put forward a set of categorical artistic practices, the listed five, there's uh, epic poetry, literature, music. Um, so he codified disciplines for the first time as having intrinsic boundaries and internal rules. Kant, in his aesthetics, if I understand this correctly, sought to overturn that, as if to say, I can look at a painting, I can look at a building, I can listen, or I can see something, and the quality of a curve in and of itself will speak to this synthetic, this notion of beauty without, and for that reason, he introduces the, a notion of uh, disinterest. I don't, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Which for Kant meant, if you have any passions, if you have any of the passions that um, your early 20th century, what's his name? The guy you just talked about. You, Shaler? Yeah, Shaler, mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, if you introduce a person and that person's passions, you're immediately obviating the possibility of a Kantian aesthetics because he cares or she cares. And once you care about something, you can never trust the, um, disinterested quality of the aesthetic judgment. And so after Freud, it became argued that there's no possibility, honestly, of a Kantian aesthetics. Uh, and so I think this is just part of that. So disinterest is crucial, and passion is the enemy of aesthetics. Uh, which is why I wanted to ask you about why cling to a description. But what happens when Clement Greenberg 
is that he takes the Kantian notion of an aesthetic judgment, but he then wants to restore the significance of disciplinary practice. So he wants there to be talk about painting. So instead of removing aesthetics from the specifics of an Aristotelian discipline, he restores the Aristotelian categories of disciplines and then focuses on the aesthetics of one discipline, the flatness, you know, the entire unfolding of that. And that's, uh, I don't know, do, do you agree with that? Yes, and the other issue in Greenberg is that he's, he's focusing on one period and one discipline. Yes. Because flatness, obviously, you can't distinguish good from bad Italian Renaissance paintings by the terms of flatness, because some of them are more flat, some less so. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so he really restricts the subject matter he's dealing with. So Elio Oitosica, who is a Brazil, was a Brazilian artist, was working with a kind of an equivalent of Clement Greenberg, whose statements of the essences of painting, for example, were no longer flatness, but was color. You know, mm -hmm. and so there are other formulations like this. But it makes the problem of aesthetics a difficult baggage to keep, a, why, in other words, why maintain it? Why keep teaching? Like I would rather say aesthetics is a historical moment in our relationship. It, it reached some, it produced some fantastic achievements and I, I wanna talk a little bit more about formalism, but it is so loaded with, a, with the problem of disinterest and the problem of autonomy that in order to find a new form of autonomy, you would be better off jettisoning it for something like a sensorium or a sensoriomatics or something like that, which also would be much more generous to cultural relativism. Uh, so can you speak yeah, to that a bit? Generally, I prefer to preserve old terms rather than introducing neologisms to try to get rid of the connotations of the old terms. So I like using words like substance and essence and quality and explaining when I introduce them, that I don't mean this in this sense here, so yes. I'm modifying it. And you do that well. And so aesthetics, uh, I would say the same thing, that it's a, it's a you know, it's introduced in modernity, but it's still a pretty old term. And I don't, I don't really have a problem with possible connotations. I just think people need to get rid of those connotations and focus on how I'm trying to use the term. You just have, you have to do a bit of setup work to make that possible, to get, get the preconceptions out of people's minds. But uh, for me, uh, aesthetics, in the sense that Triple O uses it, is not so much about a specific historic moment, but about a phenomenon that can be found at any time, which is the separation of an object from its qualities. And this is something that I think the phenomenologists account for theoretically for the first time. The separation, yeah. objects and their qualities tended to be identified. So for David Hume, an apple is just a bundle of its qualities. There's no apple apart from the qualities. Whereas in phenomenology, for the first time, you have this idea that there is an apple there that has different qualities at different times, and the apple is something separate from those qualities that can mm -hmm. be varied. And for me, aesthetic experience occurs when the, a wedge is driven between those. And it's not just aesthetics, because it turns out that for triple O, this is the key thing that happens anywhere, including in nature. Causation happens in an analogous fashion as well. Objects have a very loose relationship with their own qualities. So what you would stipulate to Tim Wharton's notion that the aesthetic realm is the realm of causality. Mm -hmm. And so the way he describes the recession of the object to leave behind its aesthetic presence mm -hmm. is consistent with your thinking of the hidden object in its relation. And yeah, I think I think if we really got into the weeds on it, we'd probably find some details. Of no, no, I'm, I'm sure there will. In but general, but yes. I mean, one of the details. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason I say this is that when I read Tim's work, it felt I must it felt like Freud reading uh, Nietzsche. He's basically saying and thinking virtually everything I'm been saying and thinking, but with maybe 5% difference, enough difference mm -hmm. to make it fun for me to read. And mm -hmm. also, but you know, Freud would not allow himself to read Nietzsche because he was so sure that Nietzsche had already discovered everything he wrote about that he didn't want to find out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he actually never brought himself to read, but he read experts on Nietzsche, mm -hmm. um, one of whom is a great English uh, philosopher that you, whose name you won't know, but who once said, Architecture is the first architecture outside the body. Dance is the first architecture of the body, and in the end, they, they're the same art. Who was this? I knew you were going to make ask me that. Um, come on, the, he wrote sexuality. He wrote three volumes on sexuality. Have like Ellis. Yes, yeah. have like Ellis. It's a great quote. Mm -hmm. Okay, I used to be able, to, like when I was a Jeopardy professional, I wouldn't have to have these lacunae. Mm -hmm. But now I have, uh, I've 
sent all my knowledge out to external storage devices that you're looking at. You actually on Jeopardy, or is that a joke? I was, uh, for three years, we were the undefeated champions of what was at the time called the GE College Bowl. And I was the captain of that team. And so from that point on, my life ambition was to get on Jeopardy. And so I went up for the interview, made 100 on the test. There were 10 people on the test. They take photographs of you, and they came to me and said, you're too fat. It's funny. I heard that twice. The second time that happened to me is when uh, Philip Johnson explained to me why he decided to let Mark Wigley become the curator of the Deconstructivist show. Mark and I were living together. We were both vying for that position. And Philip said, you know, you're both smart. You're both good. You're different. But uh, this is going to require a lot of press time. And Mark is a hell of a lot more photogenic than you are. The payback was simply this. Um, Mark worked on it, was living with me. Uh, I'll tell you that it's kind of a funny story. Um, we were best friends, played every day, planned the conquest of the architectural world together as two unknowns. And then I would go to my shrink, my uh, Alan Bass, my psychoanalyst. Oh, really? Yeah. Alan Bass. Alan Bass. Derry dot translator. Derry dot translator. This is how I picked him, by the way. I, I, I picked him on the back of the book. It said New York psychoanalyst. I was living in New York. I thought, oh, great. I'll just go get psychoanalyzed, and we can discuss Derry dot at the same time. All right. Anyway, um, I would go to Alan and say, look, my best friend took a job for me. He's working without a work permit. I'm going to report him to the IR INS today. You know. <laughs> I'm not kidding. This is like for a year. Mm -hmm. And then he, he wouldn't talk me out of it. He would Freud me out of it. You know? And then I'd go and we'd be best friends again. And you know, I finally passed time. I couldn't say I got over it. Then the show opened. And the New York Times says, uh, total intellectual disaster per perpetrated on the architecture world by the evil Philip Johnson and his uh, what do you go, you know, hit man, Mark Wigley. And then it says, people that really know the material well, that know both deconstruction and the contemporary architecture world, had enough sense to stay away from it, primarily someone like Jeff Kittness. And then, <laughs> and that totally launched my career. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, it caused Mark never again to do anything in contemporary architecture. You know, I mean, it just, he turned into a historian. Yeah, so. Let things happen. Nothing, matter never makes a mistake. I will tell you that. <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. Now, just one more thing then. Um, let's talk a little bit about last time when I did this and I said, you know, a, a noun phrase is a phrase that produces a noun as an effect, okay? You prefer nouns to verbs. I think that's a direct quote. Jacques Derrida brilliantly on page 26 above grammatology says writing breaks the noun apart. It describes relations, not appellations. Um, and so I thought this is a very important assertion that this audience needs to understand that before, it's not that you're language based. And one of the great things about your writing is also, I think, one of the lacunae and one of the weaknesses in your writing is to avoid the problem of language and its effect at marshalling objects. Um, you will, what Kant did and what Graham might have done better for his career <laughs> was stay quiet for 10 years, never publish a single thing, and then publish the three critiques in one big thing. What Graham is doing is unfolding his thinking in public over time, which makes him much more vulnerable to pests like me. But it's much more beautiful to watch the process being worked out. So You also get useful feedback that way. <laughs> so it's somebody who raises a question you weren't expecting at a conference, and that's what you get your ne next book out of, is wrestling with that problem. I have to tell you, if, if there are five other people in your field that would call that useful, I'd like to meet them. As far as I know, that is a fatal attack on you and everything you do, and you have to be immediately eliminated from the world. So I'm going to do that to you. So a noun phrase is I can make something present in the world as a noun, as an object, with a magic trick using the word that, like that which is blue, or that which can't be here, or that which cannot be held in my hand, and so when I say that which can't be held in my hand, I'm producing an, an object in my hand 
that's a noun, but only by virtue of a noun phrase, and that cannot be there by definition. But here it is. And then you said, and I thought this quite wonderful, oh, well, you're now talking about sensuous objects. Remember this moment? And so in all of your books, you don't unfold the notion of a sensuous object. Is it an object? Is it a decoy to an object? So can you tell me a little bit about sensuous objects? It's a sensual object is an object that exists only as the correlate of some other object's experience. And so we can, we can dream up any object we want. Um, I, can, I can name five random entities and say that's an object. Well, it is because I've just specified it as one, and I'll treat it psychologically as one, but that doesn't mean it's still going to be there as an object when I stop thinking about it or joking about it. Okay, so this is the, where you would call this the realism point of your... Yes. To be there, is that like in the uh, being there sense of Heidegger? Um, in other words, it has to be there in some sense that's not just frivolous. Right. And would you say in any of your writing you've given a strong account of that? Of the, of the relation between the sensual and the real object? Probably the quadruple object is the place where I've done yes. it the most so far, yeah. But wouldn't you say that all art objects are sensual objects? Um, no, no. Yes, so now you know your next book. <laughs> but go ahead, tell me about this. The reason for that is I interpret artworks as being a combination of real objects with sensual qualities. Yes. And so they have to be a real object. If they're a real object, then they're not an art object because it doesn't become an art object until it has sensual qualities, then it's not a real object. Whereas according to your own writing, Art is not a false category, nor a species, but it should be an object. When you list your, you always, in your list of 10 objects, you never put it in. Art. Really? It's there on the diagonal line called space. You get the real object and the sensual quality. Okay. So what happens, let's take the example of metaphor. That's probably the easiest example. So Homer says the wine dark sea. Well, you cannot parse that metaphor in literal terms. You can't say what Homer really means is that the sea has approximately the same hue as wine and maybe a few other things, like that both yeah. uh, suggest oblivion and both suggest danger. You can do that all day long, but as Cleanth Brooks showed, you can never paraphrase a metaphor. That's right. right? Or any literary work in general. So you've got this new object, which is the sea, that has wine dark qualities. And the wine dark qualities are sensual because you can, you can pretty clearly imagine what those are. The problem is imagining how they attach to a C. Yes. And so it becomes this withdrawn real object, unlike the central object C that you can see for yourself. The metaphor itself creates the real object C, which is not graspable. It's a Kantian thing in itself. And then what's been new in my work over the last couple of years is seeing that that really isn't possible since real objects cannot be grasped at all and every, all qualities must be attached to objects and all objects must have qualities. So what object is the wine darkness attached to if the sea is now no longer accessible? It's become metaphorized out of existence. And I realized that it has to be theatrical. Ah. My anti freedom point. So it is, in other words, it's I myself, the only real object on the scene, that do the work of that sea. I become, I'm a method actor playing the sea, playing wine dark qualities. So it, it's very theatrical there. And, and uh, that's. Okay, this is really, can you, I want you to sure. slow down and repeat sure. this. Yes. You guys need to really understand this point. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a crucial point. Yeah. If you're asking for yourself, what are the consequences for Triple O for my work in architecture? Sure. Uh, it starts off with I, who am a real object, because this is not my fictitious, fictitious life. This is my actual life. I actually am here reading Homer. That's my reality right now. I read Homer, and Homer says, wine dark sea. First of all, one thing about metaphors is they can't be too close or too far apart. So a pen is like a pencil, it's not a metaphor because all you're really doing there is saying, oh, there's similar qualities in both cases. So you're focused on the level of qualities. You also can't really say drinking a milkshake is like drawing an isosceles triangle because it's just, it's too hard. You, you, some very gifted poets actually, may be able to pull no, it No, actually, but. I think, that didn't the uh, straw man say that in the end of Wizard of Oz? He said, uh, right after he made the mistake on the, in the some of the squares of the Sosceles try of the diagonal of it. Was it, don't you remember that? It, I don't, no, it's been a while. Anyway, he, right after that he said, and also by the way, a Sosceles triangle it is very similar to a chocolate milkshake. Uh, <laughs> Probably got cut out of the version you saw. Oh yeah, you had the director's cut. 
Um, yeah, he's something funny. All right, so you're reading Homer, and it's the wine dark sea. You're not reading the dark blue sea, which would not be a metaphorical experience. You're reading the wine dark sea. So you're asked, being asked to put two things together in your minds uh, that don't quite, they go together reasonably enough that you mm -hmm. can do some work to try it's to like think about nine noun phrase trig. It's, it makes a pseudo presence. Yeah, yeah. But that presence doesn't qualify for you as real. Well, it is real, but it's actually, it's a reality that becomes absent because it's so real. So you've got wine dark sea. And another thing to notice about metaphors is that they're not symmetrical, right? They're not, they're not reversible. Yeah. Sea dark wine is also a metaphor, but it's not the same metaphor as wine dark sea. Yeah. Because if you say sea dark wine, now you're talking about the wine. And, it and the wine disappears and it has sea-like qualities, right? Yeah. And so we're talking about wine dark sea. We have sea in the, in the subject position and wine dark in the predicate position. Except there's a difficulty putting those together because you're not exactly sure how wine darkness would go with the sea because there's a lot more going on there than the darkness. So what you have is the wine dark qualities are there. We can imagine those. But the sea that would be a bearer of wine dark qualities is now a real thing separate from those qualities. And like all real objects, it withdraws. You can't get at it. You can, you can immediately experience the sensual qualities, wine darkness, or wine darks. Yes. The sea vanishes. It's not accessible, but now the problem you have is that you, those wine dark qualities need an object to adhere to because in triple O there are no objects without qualities, no qualities without objects. They're always united. You can drive wedges between them, but there, there are no qualities in a vacuum. That's phenomenology's insight, actually. There's no such thing as qualities without an object. Husserl knows this. Um, and no object without qualities. Leibniz knows that, right? Because a monad must have different qualities to make it different from the other monad. Yeah, so we're about to do both of those thinkers in a minute. So. Okay. So now you've got the, the sea which has vanished and you've got these wine dark qualities with no place to put them. The, the support for them needs to be a real object or a sensual object, but it's a real object because it's a metaphor. And that is me. It is I myself who have become the support because I'm the only real object that's not withdrawn. I'm here. I'm here experiencing the, the metaphor. Yes. Your name? Yes. The thing about this wine dark. Yes. Right. Given the idea of theatricality yes. and free, what wine dark sea also is is an epithet. Is an epithet. It's an epithet, right? It's okay. a fun, it functions within the verse form, particularly in ancient Greece, to allow it to be repeated, right? So wine dark sea shows up all the time. And okay. It works in the same way as Aegis Berry Zeus. Yes. In that it's an object that gets plugged in to kind of meet the meter requirements and all that stuff. Don't you hate people that have actually read this stuff? But so, so the point is, is that so wine dark sea. You could hang wine dark wine dark sea once it gets detached from the sea yeah. it can be attached back to you the reader, but it can also I think be attached back to the poem and through formalism, right? That the form of the poem requires a certain structure of its elements. That so wine dark sea is also a kind of irreducible object like water. Would that be? Yeah, that's that's fair, but it only works through the kind of process I'm talking about, it, as a metaphor, because it also functions other, fulfills other functions that are not metaphorical, yes. But right. aren't you, I, this is so fascinating and it's so generous of you to sub subject yourself to these kinds of questions, yeah, sure. but you're still, would it be fair to say you're still trying to parse and um, elaborate the regulating me mechanisms for what constitutes a, a real object? I mean, so for, an, for example, we're now in categories or pseudo categories of real objects, and yet they function almost as if real objects. Uh, again, this is not a criticism because I understand it's a work in process, but you're trying, you know, the, to state the case that we, that we live in an object-based reality, and, there's, and also we live in a reality that is necessarily object-based. It's very similar to the qualities of, you know, neither one nor the other exists without each other, and both are required for us to have any sense of reality whatsoever, so that there might be something called reality testing. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't test our reality against what Heidegger would like to call an authentic reality, a pre, you're, you're not opposed to the everyday life problem. Like Heidegger was violently opposed to the qualities of everyday life, um, so he wanted there he wanted to recuperate a more authentic reality, Dasein, 
uh, even though that Dasein did not include objects. Uh, and I think you're, so Dasein is this sort of being there, and there should be a being there for all the objects that Heidegger talks about. Isn't mm -hmm. it? So, mm -hmm. And this is, again, this is the kind of thing that as you leave this room and think about this a little bit, this is a really important point, because to say that not just as German idealism could have been a German realism, but phenomenological, uh, the phenomenological moment could have had two parts, uh, whether it only chose the phenomena as opposed to the, to the coherent co consistency of, and persistency of the source of the phenomena. So in that regard, without trying to be obscure, in Heidegger there's a conjecture that everything is, is this thing. Um, and that would mean something like this. You have a leaf and I can look it up and you'll, like an oak leaf, I can look up an oak leaf in an encyclopedia and see a picture of an oak leaf that no oak leaf in the entire world has ever looked like. Right. But every oak leaf in the world has certain breaks and certain cracks, which are used to be considered the accident to the essence. What Heidegger argued is no, they are of the essence, that everything is a this thing, and in its essence it can only be a thing as a this thing. Am I close That's to true. Yeah. So that puts some difficulty, it seems to me. And for example, would you there would you say that this thing is a sensuous object? Which this thing? So let's say a leaf with right. the certain qualities. Right. Uh, very similar to the dark wine, dark sea, is the cracks in the specificities of that leaf that we would at one time were called accident and now are being called the existential phenomenological truth of this thing, and that to point out the politics and intellectual project behind an ideality of an oak leaf that never exists except as an ideality versus the reality of, an every, of every oak leaf, 100% of which has these accidents. So if an oak leaf is the essence of something that appears in every oak leaf, and accidents appear in every oak leaf every 100% of the time, but, but they, have, they have different qualities, then Heidegger is saying, look, there is a new kind of object. Is that? Yes, and you're asking about the demarcation between essential and accidental attributes of a thing. And yeah. One, one side effect of triple O is that we say you can never really know the difference between an essential and an accidental feature. Husserl thinks you can know by forgetting your senses and using your intellect, right. whereas triple O says the intellect is no better at doing that than the senses are. And you know, there are other philosophers out there saying this. There's this guy, Timothy, William at, Timothy Williamson at Oxford, who talks about vagueness. Uh -huh. And he ends up reaching this conclusion, if I remember correctly, that at what moment did Aristotle become old? Well, most of us would say, well, you can't really pinpoint an exact moment when Aristotle became old. Whereas Williamson argues you, there is an exact moment, but you can never know exactly when it is. But there must be an exact moment when Aristotle became old. We're just going to be sure what it is. And I'm, I'm, I like that conclusion. I, I can't reconstruct his argument at the moment, but I like that idea. The, the, okay. the difficulty in pinpointing when something happens doesn't mean it didn't happen at a specific no, point. I think, uh, and in fact, the idea that there would be such a thing as pinpointing when something happened, right. the pinpoints are never moments. They are, for example, at what point did the species uh, homo sapien arise, you never, it will never be a moment. You know, so this notion that there are these linear divisions and thresholds between one existence and another existence, that's one of the problems that I think you handle well. The fact that they form a continuity doesn't mean they produce a continuum. I'm not even sure there's a continuity. I definitely don't think they're a continuum. But we, you didn't mention my immaterialism book today, which you mentioned a lot last time, but I'm, I'm trying to argue there that precisely there are certain symbioses that mark Yes. forward steps. Yeah, I mean, trust me, we could spend the next uh, 24 hours and I can keep talking to you and making these guys can leave and I could give a damn. I mean, but mm. because these are super interesting problems. Yep. But for example, in that one situation, um, so you understand he doesn't believe in continuums. Um, well, they, they exist, but they don't, ex they exist only in one part of reality. You know, Aristotle handles this pretty well. Aristotle in the physics says, how many parts are there in this room? Well, that's, that's a continuum. You can divide it up any way you want. How many moments of time are in this discussion? Same thing. You can arbitrarily divide it up how you want. But how many people are in the room? That's not a continuum. There's an exact number of people you can count. You can't say, well, potentially there's one, peop one person here or five, however you want to cut them up. No, because they're individuals. Okay, but just, just, uh, just to, uh, 
I'm just making sure I'm doing your time right. Um, just to make sure that I'm going to segue a little bit, because, for example, in the tradition of alchemy, which I'm going to be talking about in a little bit, there is no such thing as a number. Like a number is, there's no such thing as a thing called two or right. five. Meaning not so much the numeral, but there's no existence to the mathematical object of the quantity two. So what every alchemist will speak of is two-ness. It will be a quality, but it will not have a, be an object. So, so when you, for example, do you think of mathematical objects as real? I'm undecided on that question, but it's a question that's in my mind. I don't really have a developed philosophy of mathematics. Yeah, but to get to a philosophy of mathematics is going to be, in, in the end, to get to a philosophy of, which I will try to segue to a little bit. Um, one of the curiosities is the, that every philosopher, every thinker, every architect has to grapple with is the magical relationship between mathematics and the behavior of things in the world. Mm -hmm. um, it's shocking, mm -hmm. and it should shock every one of you. And what will happen in architecture, for example, is you'll start to think of mathematics as real and not ideal, but actual. And then you'll think of your materialization of the object in, very platon in that object in very platonic terms as a poor approximation. So for an architect, a cube, a built cube is a poor but best possible representation of an ideal cube, whereas for other kinds of philosophies, what constitutes a cube in architecture is not a defective version of what constitutes a cube in mathematics. An architectural cube is, an, is a cube in its own right with its own requirements for, and own problems. So for example, an architectural cube has a, the problem of the bottom. It's six side. For there to be a cube, you have to have a relationship to all sides. So every time you see an architectural cube, it's going to be lifted off the ground. This issue doesn't even occur for an ideal object cube. But miraculously, every time a mathematical object is uh, invented or discovered, and we're not clear which, even when they should have no relationship to the world at all, even though no one has proved this to be a necessary condition of the relationship, the history has shown that it will turn out that we will discover a relationship between the behavior of things and matter and mathematics. Like uh, Riemannian geometry. Riemannian geometry. Which Einstein or, adopted, yep. Yeah, non, like non-Euclidean geometry, which was the, developed by a guy named Lobachevsky. He took the parallel postulate which was the eighth postulate from Euclid. He suspended the parallel postulate, wanted to know if he could make a mathematics in which parallel lines do meet at infinity. He worked out a fully consistent, self-consistent geometry that everybody thought was a kind of monstrosity of thought. And it ended up being the better description of the world than um, all of the Newtonian geometry that preceded it. Which also meant it produced an object that I think is incredibly interesting called empty space. You know, so the, read is, the reason matter can deform space is that it can have a conversation with space, that there's an exchange uh, somehow or another between matter and space. So therefore matter, so space, empty space, may not be a thing, but it has to be an object. Would you say, and that much you would, I think. And so I think these problems uh, entangle your, the, the question of the mathematical object and the question of the art object it's going to be difficult and fascinating if you try to keep them separate. Um, and yet, I don't think either one of them needs the human actor. In fact, early on in your conversation, you were pointing out that one of the problems of uh, Patrick Schumacher's thinking, or one of the, your questions is, that this radical, radical continuity would seem to make a complete presence of architecture, and that there had to be some part of the work that receded. Mm -hmm. and so, um, and that was one of your critiques of Patrick's mm -hmm. thinking, that mm -hmm. the continuity is that it becomes an intrinsically uh, present con connection of context and... Um, if everything were communication, there'd be no individuality in architecture or anything else. That's right. Which seems to contradict a little bit to the actor and moment, the uh, art and architecture. So you have this moment where one moment you need architecture to have an autonomy, and in another moment, you wonder if it can possibly have an uh, autonomy. Interestingly, post-crisis, 
Yeah, I mean, these are beautiful moments in the thing. I, these are, I want no one to think of me as trying to show holes in his thinking. I'm trying to show the inevitable questions that arise as somebody's studying a developing body of thinking. And um, so I just wanted to make sure as to not um, sound like I was trying to, let's say, win an argument. I, I think the problems are more fascinating. The reason for that is, is that you're placing, but I'm a, I'm going to try one more formulation. Anytime anybody wants to talk or ask a question, please do. Uh, I'm trying to stop these formulations from becoming too obscure. And so my work that I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, on re-alchemy uh, is, and the word is supposed to resonate between re-alchemy, bringing alchemy uh, back in, and real chemi. <laughs> and I did this to honor Graham because chemistry, the word chemistry itself comes from an ancient Egyptian, the ancient name of the word Egypt, and he came from Egypt. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna name my entire philosophy after my encounter with Graham Harmon and call it real alchemy or real chemi, real chemi. Now, um, and this is important, I think, because of the line of thinkers, it requires to, for me, it starts with Newton and Leibniz, goes to Whitehead, Derrida, Deleuze, and now to you. And this is probably not a lineage you would like to, that you're easy as imagining. You take quite a bit of issue with Leibniz's uh, characterization of the East India Company. Mm -hmm. okay. On the other hand, I'm a, so now I'm talking to you a little bit about Leibniz, and what we want to talk about here is this notion of a monad. And I want to give an alternative question to uh, Graham's beautiful borrowing of the ancient conundrum about what happens when fire burns cotton. Does fire encounter the cotton in its entirety, or does fire only meet a caricature of the cotton? And, and as I understand your answer at the moment, is that the cotton is always receding, leaving back a caricature, and all the fire could ever meet is the character. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, I'm going to say that if you read the monadology, uh, you will answer that question slightly different, and that is the fire meets the cotton in its monadic entirety, but only sees some parts in perspicacity and some parts in obscurity. So that's how Leibniz characterizes it. So I'll, we'll explain this a little bit more. But So that's why we're here. So in Leibniz, uh, in the monadology, for example, it's curious that you turn to this obscure, I didn't even know about this whole exchange. Um, about the East India Company? Yeah, yeah, it was quite amazing. And, but if you read the actual monadology, which he wrote for the king, it's the best thing ever written in philosophy, you guys. It's 108 paragraphs, six pages. It's the smartest, like, it's short. You can read it in the bathroom. It's, he wrote it for an idiot king, so any idiot can understand it, like us. Um, he also wrote a whole bunch of other stuff, which you, you hire professionals to, to comb through and see if there's anything. So you don't read all of Leibniz. You just read the important, funny, short parts. Let the professionals dig up difficult stuff, and then you think about how to beat them or enjoin them. So the East India Company and the necklace, all of those were in contradiction to a moment in the monadology because Leibniz, believe it or not, in his day, what we think of as the cell phone, which is something that everybody has to have, in that day, it was the pocket microscope. So Laban Oak invented a microscope, which was just a piece of metal and a little bulb of uh, glass and you could hold it up to everything your teeth and you could see all the bacteria on your teeth and it was you can read very funny accounts people would go to restaurants or public settings and everybody would be pulling out their microphones and their the restaurants would have rules like or the places would have turn your microphone off I mean turn your microscope off like it was the annoyance of the day and uh, Leibniz was uh, entranced by the microscope, and in fact, he entered into a correspondence with Laban Oak, ordered one of Laban Oak's first microscopes. And there's this passage in the monadology where he describes 
a pond, a drop of water of a pond. And the, when you look at the drop of water, you then see a whole world. And so this is a key moment between a debate between him and Newton, and it's why Newton ends his entire life on alchemy. So we'll get to this in a moment. So what he's saying is there are no part to whole relationships. Everything is a whole, and that the monad in itself has no parts. Now, he's, till, he's a religious person, and so he's working in a theological idea of the spirit as a disembodied reality that requires a body. You know, so, you have, so what I'm actually trying to do is similar to what Graham does, and that is what would someone today who is matter-based in their thinking, how would they treat and think of the monad, which is like, uh, I'm sorry, Deleuze does this in a book. He begins this process in a book called Le Plea. And that's sort of where I take off. Now, what do you think about that pond analogy? I mean, do you think it's an effective understanding? I mean, do you think it's a breakdown in the thinking so as to make it easier for the king to understand? Or does it actually contain, like it means that the drop of water is not got a little part, a lot of little parts. Now in mathematical history, this turned out to be the crucial debate between Newton and Leibniz on the calculus. Newton thought the closer you got to a curve, the more it turned into a straight line. Leibniz thought the closer you got to the curve, the more each little piece of it was still that curve. Never would it there. So he rejected the limit formulation of every, every line is a straight line when you get closer to it. Um, in, in favor of, uh, so that D over DT notation is to show that the incremental piece maintains the characteristics of the whole piece. I, I think this is a very fundamental problem. Um, and I want to know where you are. Which side, does it ring, ring to you as a problem that you understand what I'm asking? Yeah, but I would maintain the part-whole relationship. And of course, the price Leibniz pays for this idea that everything seeing everything else with more or less clarity or obscurity mm -hmm is that uh, monads have no windows, and therefore they're given all their relations in advance by God. And so that's, that's his formulation. I'm right. about to point out something you said before. That, like in a material or a matter world, mm -hmm. uh, for example, electrons have no windows. Remember you said in that cute that moment, wonderful moment, I, won't, I might take too much advantage of it, that we, per we perhaps know more about the electron than any other object. And I would tell you that a physicist would say, we don't know anything about an electron except what it does in reactionship to other things. No, one, he, you, no physicist would claim to be able to say what the essence of an electron is for the following reason. Mm -hmm. Like a monad, an electron can absorb photons. And when they absorb photons, they get excited. Mm -hmm. But it has no structure. It has no window. No internal structure, yeah. There's no way for a photon to get in. There's no understanding of what it means for a photon, which itself is an object, mm -hmm. to become one with an electron and change the state of the electron. And then when an electron gets sad, it cries out a photon. Hmm. You know, I mean, so in a world of matter theory, you're st you start to get the same react relationship to philosophical thinking as, let's say, to mathematics is, what was thought of as metaphor turns out to be precise description of certain things. You know? And so I would say it's an equal formulation to say that the cotton is only met by fire in the terms of a caricature to saying that the fire only was able to see the cotton in its totality, but most of it was obscure. Because in fact, the fire doesn't just burn the cotton. It analyzes the cotton, it tells us its parts, it turns it into gas. I mean, it, there is a profound relationship, you know, um, that's not just the burning. And that that profundity of the relationship, I think, is lost if in the caricature and recession problem. The cotton, as an object, recedes, leaves some part of it for aesthetic causation or causation. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't need one of these to be right or the other to be right. I think they're compatible. Um, but you would seem to think that you, you were opposed to Leibniz. I mean, you, mm -hmm. and Whitehead, by the way. Mm -hmm. That's and right. I'm about to get to Whitehead in a second. I think the problem with 
saying that everything perceives everything in more or less clear, obscure form turns the problem into a continuum that I don't think should be a continuum. Okay. That some things simply do not affect anything else. Can are you not affect, like, like uh, um, dark matter. <laughs> yeah, or even this. I don't think this bottle is affected by everything that happens in the universe, which is something that follows from Leibniz's and Whitehead's. You don't. No, I don't. But do you think it's, it does feel the gravitational pull of everything that exists in the universe? Because R squared, there is no terminus to the length of that. Except that it, gravity only travels at the speed of light, and some things are outside of our light cone. And so some of the influences haven't gotten here yet. That's why I said, OK. But let's say that bottle is certainly feeling the rotation of the, the revolution of the moon around the Earth at this moment. It's feeling quite a number of things, yes. But there are things it doesn't feel at all. Yes. So uh, the, I call this firewalls, that every object has firewalls that prevent everything from affecting it. You know how permeable firewalls are. You must uh, really not have a very, <laughs> you must not, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I want to uh, elaborate on your use of mathematics to ask, ask grammar Sure, questions. please. And, and you use uh, specific moment in history when physicists started uh, conducting equations in ideal space where like, uh, like an object traveling on a frictionless surface. Yep. So do I understand your question correctly? So you see, so uh, what you're talking about in physics are first approximations. So in order to, to isolate the path of a object and a force, you try to remove confusing forces. Right. So if I want to find out the behavior of a ball and push it, and I want to know the effect of my pushing it, I want to get rid of the friction or the air pressure. And so these are first approximations, and they're intentionally simplifications on the principle that the, com that the entire effect will be a sum of the various forces, and you look at them one at a time. And you're saying that he does that for the object, that object-oriented ontology puts objects in various, um, it frees them in the sense that it frees them from having to be obligated to every other force or every other influence to think about what they are as objects. Is that something I can write that? Would you agree with that? Sure. See, much easier. Yeah. <laughs> he says yes. <laughs> and now, I'm going to ask you something. Um, there's a guy named Whitehead. You don't have to know who any of these people are. Um, I could say a joke about his brother. By the way, if anybody wants to see a wine dark sea, uh, a picture of it, you just have to turn around and look at that wall. You can see eight or nine, a whole set of maps with the wine dark sea right there in reality. <laughs> Sorry, this is what I do. Well, I can't see behind, oh yeah. So, the whitehead, part of the disillusionment or disenchantment of modernism that bothered this guy Whitehead was that Newtonian mechanics only, would only describe the world in terms of the effect of a force on a relatively unimportant object. So Newtonian physics doesn't say anything about the inside of the object, how the object feels, how it responds. It just says, if I push it, it's going to do this. And so you get this clock model of the universe where causality and reality and future predictability are all joined. And at the same time, it totally annihilates the significance of the inner life of the object. So the inner life of an object in Whitehead is not just the inner life, inner life of a human object. It's a human inner life of all objects. And so he starts to ask, how does an electron know or want to stay with a proton? You simply describe it as the physics of the equations does you no good whatsoever because all it is is describing the external forces and the consequences that they produce without any sensitivity to the inner life. 
and that that had got extended in the horrors of World War One and World War Two by the radical objectification of one human being by another human being. And so he saw in that a great political problem. Um, and so he felt like philosophy had to take up the problem of the inner life of an object in order to complete the Newtonian picture. Are you following this? And th this is why most people don't know this, but uh, Newton spent seven years, three years on the optics and four years on mechanics. He finished the entire physics, uh, all the physics he ever did in his entire life, he did in the first seven years of his position, um, and he produced the Princip Prin Principia and the optics, and for the next 34 years of his life, he did nothing but alchemy. He turns his attention, he, w he was probably the greatest living alchemist in the old sense of the term, tried to make philosopher's stone, tried to actually solve the alchemical problems. Biographers of Newton have tried to figure what this is, was out. Was it because he had a theological obsession and decided that the physics was uh, fait accompli, was easy to do, but he wanted to go on to a more important object. What I think is he realized that his own physics was defective precisely for these reasons. For example, every object uh, stays in motion unless active, in, stay, every object in motion stays in motion in a straight line unless acted on by an outside force. The question was always, where are these straight lines? How does an object know what a straight line path is? Where is the geometry that it follows? In particular, because he's the same physicist who said every, that, that there is no length to geometric, um, to gravitational sensitivity. So every object in the world, according to Newton, has two problems. One is it's being constantly acted on by a multiple number of outside forces, at least gravitational. And at the same time, its behavior reflects an ideality in, of mathematics in the universe that no one can quite locate. Now this turned out to be what's called the absolute frame problem and was solved by Einstein when, he, when Einstein showed that, in fact, empty spaces, you know. Um, but for a long time, it was considered a proof of God, that simply the proof, the, the adequacy of, Newton, of Newton's mathematical description of the universe and his idealities of geometry proved God. And, and so, of course, it was a Jew that fucked that up. <laughs> Einstein. Yep. Very quick. Well, hang on now. You can't answer the question for him. In other words, you, I'm still asking the question. no. But the, you asked two questions: uh, Is Stravinsky's right a spring an object, or is the performance of Stravinsky's right of spring an object? So okay. the minute you turn it into being something to be heard, like don't you think Stravinsky's right of spring exists even if there's no performance? Well, yeah, and that's exactly. There you have it. And there's actually a lot of objects involved because individual themes from Rite of Spring can also be objects. Okay. Um, oh, absolutely. And in fact, lots of stories and, yeah. You know, I mean, and the, the best proof that the Rite of Spring is an object is that it can be performed multiple times and none of those performances quite exhaust what's there. You can find infinitely many ways to perform, maybe not infinitely, but large, finite number of performances are possible of that piece. Mm -hmm. Some of which, uh, are in accord, let's say, with its original conception, and some of them are radically different. And we hear it's impossible for you to hear it today in anything like its original form. And in fact, this is why Derrida, in one of the formulations I think is really important to remind ourselves of, taught us that the copy or the reproduction constructs the original as the original which is not to say that the copy is more important. So, are you, how old are you? You have children? You, are you, have, are you have children? No, I don't have children. Okay, are, are you an only child? No. Oldest, youngest? Eldest. Uh, which came first, you or your father? Father. Okay, now, 
I don't know how many times I've taught this, and I know it's so easy to understand, but the day you become a father, you're going to realize that the answer is, I'm not a father. You're going to sit there and think, I don't know what to do with this kid. You're going to say, I'm just a normal guy. This kid has turned me into a father. So the father never comes first. It's the reproduction or the copy that produces the original. But the thing that's so wonderful about that formulation is that it doesn't stop the original from being the original. It maintains its originality, but it's being constantly reconstructed by the future in the past. Um, and so that is a, there is, so there is an original rite of spring. There is an original Mona Lisa. There, there's all these things as originals, but they are constantly not, it's not they're not being revised, it's that they're being imbued with more and more qualities in their originality without it interrupting their originality. And so. Wouldn't, wouldn't these be qualified then to be consensual? Because music well, as an object. I, I knew where you were going, so that's why I planted you there. <laughs> Wouldn't music qualify only as a sensual object? Well, yeah, I mean, so it has a quality of a sense because we can only experience this object via the sense of hearing. Well, that, now sensations. Let's go with, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll guide you to following. I'm like the Tommy. I'm a sensation. Remember that song? It's by the Who. It's true, it's absolutely true. You are a sensation. Go ahead. All right, what makes something a sensual object is when it only exists as a correlate of the perceiver or the experiencer, which isn't just human for me, by the way. They're, inanimate objects can experience things just as for Whitehead. Absolutely. A thing is real when it has some autonomous reality that can support many different relations to it or many different experiences of it. And uh, I would say in the case of the music, just as in the case of water needing both hydrogen and oxygen, the music needs both the uh, the written music or the ideal music and then the hearer of it. Um, the problem with that then is how to account for the fact that the Rite of Spring exists right now even if no one's actually playing it or listening to it, which I would also agree with. Mm -hmm. Just like mathematical objects can exist even when no one is thinking about them or looking at them. Yeah, or do they? I mean, that would be the Yeah, it's this question. But this starts to raise the question of Okay, so how so? The, in that, I think it's easier, for me anyway, to see noise as real. Like noise happens, it doesn't need me, it is, it's just... Mm. It's a Trees that fall make a noise. Trees fall, noise, all that, yeah. <laughs> but noise re-originated as music seems to require a relation mm -hmm. to me. And so if I use that as a kind of parallel to buildings and architecture that you know, and I have often argued that architecture cannot be reduced to buildings, and I'm not alone in making that argument. And that seems to push me toward architecture, well, architecture as being in some sense sensual, and in some sense, if, if you want to argue architecture as a real object, it's the discipline of architecture, not buildings, not stuff. But I wonder if you taken that, taken up those kinds of distinctions in your thinking yet? Because I, I don't think I've encountered it yet. All right, I guess without a without a listener, music is also noise, right? Yeah. Our music is probably noise for many insects, if not all of them. Um, and so you're wondering if I've taken up the theme of how a discipline could be an object, but not the individual things produced by that discipline? I'm trying to get into architecture, and so I'm using the kind of noise yeah. to music relations as a, as a stepping stone. Well, I think I'd like to hear your argument for why architecture is a discipline as an object and not about buildings. Uh, ah. Because I think I agree with Rainer Bannon when he says that architecture is not what is done, but how it is done. Nah, none of this. You were on a good track up to this point. Oh. <laughs> Idiot. I, I don't think architecture is the stuff. I think architecture is the cultural apparatus that constitutes the stuff understood as architecture as opposed to buildings. 
So when, say, Nicholas Petzner says, a cathedral is architecture, no matter how bad it is, and a bicycle shed is not, no matter how good it is, I think that there's some truth to that. I think that the architecture, the discipline of architecture constructs understandings of buildings, converts them from buildings to architecture. Well, when Calatrava changes the garage door to a wing opener, and let's call the garage a shed, did it become architecture? Yeah, it just happens to be bad architecture. Okay, as long as it's good or bad architecture. Listen, I think this is really important and we're gonna pursue this a little bit. Um, the easiest way, I think, to say it is this. Uh, if you think of a window as something that lets in light, gives you views, and lets in air, then you understand the role of a window in a building. If you understand that the window also frames pictures, to separates the inside from the outside, creates patterns, symbolic, eidetic, or other patterns. So architecture is simply the magic trick that can be done with the materials of buildings. But buildings, most buildings, and also most buildings that exist when looked at by an architect can be seen to be doing magic. Right. So there's an intimate relationship between the two. But to take one out and turn it into an expert practice of producing architectural tricks which totally shape culture um, as part of, and then we at least have a vested interest in saying there's a really important difference between buildings and objects, uh, I mean, uh, and architecture. So I would say, now that's sadly called architecture with a capital A, and most young students of architecture find that account inadequate to what they would like to think of the possibilities of agency in the world of a building and therefore of their own task. And it's similar, I would say, to what's the difference between food and cuisine. And you should never think of cuisine as a enrichment of food. It is something different. Uh, it's not about, and, and you shouldn't think of music as an enrichment of noise. In fact, space doesn't enter the discourse of architecture until 1893, but noise doesn't enter the discourse of music in 1923, and doesn't become really important until Cage. So the entire history of the writing on musical theory contains no mention of sounds or noise until the 20th century disenchantment idea, and we, we now are going to become scientifically. So you can ask someone which is more real, 440 seconds, 440 cycles per second, or a, the, the sound of an A below, uh, above middle C. And a scientist will say the 440 cycles per second is the best account for it, but a composer can't do anything with that. So if, for a composer, it's real. For a scientist, it's representation. And in fact, if I were to go a little bit further in this, and I, this is, I'm gonna, I wanna get to my little bit and then we're gonna call it a day. So there is a passage in, do you, you're not a Deleuze reader. I don't know. I am, but just not as enthusiastically as you probably did. Yeah. yeah, I'm enthusiastic, you know, I have a very short attention span. So I love it, yeah. There, my favorite scene in all movies is from two, uh, Fiddler on the Roof. I don't know if you ever watched it. Um, Tevia, the jerk, the idiot jerk, is listening to two smart people talk, two rabbis. He listens to the first rabbi, and Tevia says, you know, he's right. And then the second rabbi makes his counter argument. And then he says, you know, he's right. And then the third rabbi says, Tevia, they can't both be right. And he says, you know, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> that is my, I saw that scene and I think, that's me. I have permission to just keep saying you're right. You know, I'd rather say you're right than you're wrong and realize that we're all building up slowly a partial set of rights that seems incompatible, but eventually gets us to a place where we can sleep better. Hopefully. No, one more, one more second. Okay. So, in Deleuze's uh, identity and no, difference in repetition, he says, the sign is an effect of a signal. And he's doing that because he's taking issue with the structuralist and linguistic imperative of the time. Um, and for the first time ever reading that, I thought, 
because at that point in time, I'm steeped in theories of signification. I'm thinking the sign is the thing. In fact, Derrida describes it as the sign is the only word in which no one can talk about what it's the representation of, a unique feature of the sign. So signifier and signified in the word sign are the same thing. So the way I tried to put this forward, and I think it's in this objectology essay, is let's say a baby chick in a nest makes a sound. So it's the, the point of the sound, the intention of the sound, but also the, the note is that chick asking its mother for food. But if you're an owl, you're hearing food. If you're a worm, you're hearing threat. If you're an ornithologist, you're hearing a species. And if you're an avalanche, just at the poise at the point of, I mean, if you're a snowbank, just poised at the point of an avalanche, looking for a certain frequency, that frequency might be say to you, start your avalanche. And so the promiscuities of the signal and its capacity to become a affective force in the world compared to its parochial signifying intention sets out an entire different view than the linguistic and the structuralist and post-structuralist view. And it, it's consistent, I think, with anything that makes a sound, anything that hears a sound, doesn't matter if uh, is uh, alive or not, they are talking in some sense. And so that's where I began to think of matter theory as, opposed, as, as different. So do your objects, does the receding object stay in communication with the piece it leaves forward to be its caricature? Does the cotton? Actually, what remains in contact with the caricature is the new object formed of the two as a whole. OK. So in a way, in a way that caricature is generated by the combined object more than it is by the one object that's being caricatured. Right. In other words, I, I have nothing to do with the caricature of me that you're seeing. No, I understand that. It's, yeah. it's generated by our relation. But because. When you guys talk about material, I'm talking about you and Slavoj. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, I'm a person who studied science. I love science. I, but I, the point of me is to make sure I use science against scientism mm -hmm. and to, to maintain the, the enchantment of one parochial area of life, which is art and architecture. You know, so that, I'm, not, I'm not a big thinker. I'm a, but my, I care as much about uh, scientific knowledge as I care about philosophical and poetic knowledge. And so I like to have these um, at hand. Any good physicist or any good chemist or biologist today will say there's not, matter is not material, not empty putty, not, not mother, not the core. It's, what it is is the consequence of three things that are irreducible and continuously occurring. Everything transmits a signal. Everything receives a signal. And in the process of both transmitting and receiving, they are transformed in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. And so that's what matter is. So matter, that's Bale. Do you remember W.E.Y.L. the physicist? Mm -hmm. That's gauge theory. Mm -hmm. It comes from Leibniz's relationalism, and it's why you think of uh, Whitehead as too relational. Mm -hmm. But at the heart of that, is a complete confidence and necessity of the object. So it's not relational in the sense that the only thing that matters is what's transmitted, what's received, but it's the transformation of the sender and the receiver. So the electron, when it sends out a photon, it changes from one state to another. When it receives a photon, it changes from one state to another. And there is no place in the universe where the continuum, the mathematics of the continuum, that's necessary to describe that actually occurs. And so over 53, 63 orders of magnitude from the diameter of the universe to Planck's length, everything that occurs, including at our own level, at our own scale, organizes itself into objects. There are no examples anywhere in the universe of a free-form, mid-continuum, let's say, missing link. So even though every species evolves, it is at any moment complete. Mm -hmm. Now, this is one of the great insights of your thinking, was to take this notion, this debate between 
the radical incompletion, the radical undecidability, and the radical probabilistic uh, uncertainty that Slavoj is interested in and would like to build a worldview on. And take note of the fact that there is no moment in the entire history of the universe ever in which things are between objects. Mm -hmm. Now, if I wanted you to take away anything is to keep reading this work to find out what he can do with this. Because the other thing he says is these objects are in the universe. There's no topos Uranus, no ideal place that the universe is a representation of. So as, as far as I'm concerned, the matter theory understanding of matter is one of the most supportive tools of your uh, triple O because it's both material and not material. The, the material idea, this idea of putty waiting for form, is too, um, it's too ham-fisted a first approximation. Okay, so what I'm gonna suggest to you is, and I'm about to show you this, is that, um, and what alchemy is matter theory. That's the question of alchemy is not so much what's the science of the matter, but what's the inner life and total behavior of the transmission receiving and, and but like I, but if you're that bird, and you're an architect, you're not gonna hear that signal. You're gonna hear that signal differently. So this one signal that gets transmitted, and just think of how many signals are being transmitted by how many objects, starts to produce what I think is not one ontology. I think what you describe as the flat ontology is something even more important, and that is a flat ecology mm -hmm. of multiple ontologies, and that what makes it flat is that they form a co-productive and continually evolving whole complete world mm -hmm. of related ontologies. But you would, so I need, for example, the cartoon world, the world of cartoons, to be a different ontology than the world of reality mm -hmm. because I consider them real. Mm -hmm. uh, they are, cartoons are real, cartoon figures are real, but they don't obey the same physics, they don't obey the same laws of you know, so they may, in, a, in a traditional ontological sense, I can identify many ontologies. And what you mean by, like, so a good physicist today would say there's no such thing as infinity. It's a placeholder for something we don't quite yet understand it yet. But there probably is no such thing as the reality of infinity. Because you get infinities of different sizes. Mm -hmm. um, I would say to you that we need to think of a different formulation of the field of the receding objects. Because your first approximation, which are hybrids and symbiotic, are too dialectical. They're not polyelectrical enough. They don't speak to the fact that that single bird is sending out 15 signals to different ontological environments and affecting those environments in different ways. How is symbiosis too dialectical? Uh, well, for example, you can specify the parts and specify the hybridization. What, what you're not doing is specifying all the other things that get transformed in the implication of the symbiosis. Like, I do think it's a great first approximation, much like Taylor's expansion you know, uh, in mathematics. So I guess here's a good, here's a good let me just try this example. Then I'm gonna show you this little video. So Samuel Coleridge in 1810 wrote a really wonderful, he was a drug addict. Y'all know this? He wrote his best poetry, Smoking Opium. But he was also a brilliant writer and a brilliant thinker. He wrote for the Encyclopedia of Poetry, what were the necessary, he was asked, what is the necessary condition for a poem to be a poem? And he said, the suspension of disbelief. So this idea that the theatricality requires a conscious suspension of disbelief. So I go in to a theater. I know I'm not in Copenhagen. The lights go down. I let myself momentarily get transported to Copenhagen, and then I watch the play bore. Then at the end of that play, I go back. Now, Frankel, there's arts. You remember Kunstvolen? Kunstvolen was a concept put forward by an art theorist in the early 20th century. He said, really, it's the object that tells you. You don't suspend the disbelief, but the theatrical setting, and puts you in that state. And you don't go from 
a suspended dis state of disbelief to reality, you go from one suspended disbelief to another suspended disbelief. So the original formulation of Coleridge was a brilliant first approximation that later on becomes ham-fisted when we, when we realize that we can't settle back into at least a Kantian confidence of who we are, that we know who we are in the world. Would you, how would you feel about that, that description? I didn't hear anything to eject to. I, so I, I love that formulation. Uh, you, you, I learned that from you last time. I've said that 5,000 times. I got pulled over by the cops. He said how fast we were going. I said, I don't hear anything I need to object to. <laughs> and he said, here's your ticket. But anyway, I, I did, at least I didn't get arrested. It's a way of reserving the right to disagree later if I feel like no. there's some implications later I don't want to All accept. Right. Yeah, uh, and I'm, it's true. But, um, so I now want to show you a, a video. I mean, we're just running out of time. So can I get my, and what I'm going to suggest to you is that one of the problems that you're facing and that I hope our conversations and other conversations like with Tim and other people can help unfold because the success of your project has such profound instrumental consequences uh, is that the receding object as a... Now, what I'm about to show you are some moments from a show I love to watch on TV called uh, How the Universe Works. And this is the second episode on dark matter. Uh, and I'm just gonna show you a couple of clips. And what you're going to find out is that, and what I'm proposing to you is this is an analogy that dark matter's relationship to matter is an, an analogous to his objects in relationship to their presence. Um, but I think it's more than analogy. I think it's a simultaneous, simultaneity of formulations of things in the world. So what you're going about to see is how dark, dark matter, which is a real substance in the world, uh, changes and affects the entire world without participating in the world. It recedes from the world. But it can only do this is because, like everything else in the world, it has one form of sensation, one form it produces gravity. It does not absorb light. It has no way of interacting with matter at all, period, except by gravity. It's not clear whether it even can interact with itself, but it's real and it's in this universe. And so it's not an ideality outside of this universe. It's not even as, as uh, obscure as a Higgs field. I'm, I'm not gonna explain all this. So, so I'm gonna just play a few little pieces of this. And what I'm proposing to you is that this is actually a pretty good model for triple O. The evolution of us. Just a, just a Dark matter is kind of like a, an invisible puppet master with invisible strings controlling the movement of everything we can see. It is the central reason for our existence. The fact that our galaxy exists for us to exist in is due to the fact that dark matter exists. If you were to think about it, dark matter is the matter that matters. Okay, so... There's more. There's a better, it's more stuff. This, this is titillating. So these are physicists that are saying, actually, dark matter answers almost all the questions that we need to be answered about the behavior of matter. For example, why the universe exists at all. When you say a galaxy, if you're speaking to a matter theorist who's a scientist, you're talking about the irreducible basic unit of the universe. So the, the smallest piece you can divide some, the monad of the universes are galaxies. And so our existence on this planet has to do with precisely how the galaxy was formed and precisely where we are in the galaxy to incredibly small levels of precision. So galaxies and human beings are intimately connected to one another in a very simple formulation how galaxies formed at all was a question that no one has been able to answer for a while till they discovered dark matter. Now, dark matter is totally not interactive. Remember this thing about sending, receiving, and, and transforming, except to gravity. Light doesn't affect it, nothing affects it. In fact, it's not dark at all, it's totally transparent. So, now watch this. 
But the point is, dark matter isn't a pictorial version or doesn't have any... See, I think in Graham's thinking, there is a kind of legacy of pictorial relationship between the receding object and the new aesthetic object. Or they seem like they should be alike. Whereas what you're gonna discover in dark matter is they, they're not alike at all. It's not even matter. 84% of the entire universe is made of this. 16% is made of this. Um, and yet the characteristics of this are nothing at all like this, but this cannot be the way it is without it. My argument or my suggestion is that in triple O, the quality of that world of the recession has the same lack of familiarity, lack of uh, belonging to the same identifying qualifiers um, that the leftover thing we call the object is. And that, so watch this, this is kind of fun. Dark matter surrounding the galaxy. A dark matter halo helps a galaxy form simply by providing gravity to pull things together, catalyzing it. And that may have allowed our galaxy to form. The gravity from this huge construct brought regular matter in to form the Milky Way in the middle. Astronomers used to think the distribution of galaxies throughout the universe was random. But recent observations have discovered something extraordinary. Walls of interlinked galaxies that stretch through space for millions and millions of light years. One of the most amazing discoveries of the last few decades is that galaxies form these vast superstructures that actually span the known universe. The Great Wall is a filament of galaxies that stretches hundreds of millions of light years. To understand how these vast galactic structures formed, astronomers use telescopes like the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, or ALMA, for Just gonna skip this part a little bit. of the earliest galactic structures. Now ALMA can actually look back into the history of the universe and see similar structures being formed by these giant baby galaxies, sort of a proto-Great Wall. ALMA gives us a snapshot of how the adolescent universe evolved. It shows us that as the universe expanded, the newborn galaxies aligned with their neighbors. It was as if the expanding universe was producing sticky filaments and the materials building new galaxies were sticking to these threads like flies to a spider's silk. It turns out these invisible filaments are dark matter. It's like a scaffolding of dark matter that was pulling normal matter into it. As the universe expanded, the original clumps of dark matter didn't expand as quickly as the rest. They stuck together like sticky taffy with their powerful gravity shaping them into filaments. The filaments formed a sprawling web of dark matter strands stretching throughout the universe. The gravity of this dark matter web then dragged in normal matter, which built up where the filaments meet and eventually collapsed to form galaxies. The thicker filaments pulled in the most gas, providing the building blocks for galaxy clusters. They actually fall along these tremendous filaments across the universe, hundreds of millions of light years across. We're talking about tremendously large structures, but they would not exist if it weren't for dark matter. And the galaxies themselves were able to form because of this structure. There are galaxies and stars and planets and you here today. That's because of the dark matter providing the framework. <laughs> Just like a grid system in a city defines where buildings are going to be, galaxies assemble themselves around the cosmic grid. It seems like city planners here on Earth have been following the lead of the universe, except those plans. Okay. Now, I will, I commend this program to you. In fact, I commend the entire series of this program. 
I will tell you at the end of this program that the event that produces human beings on Earth, which is the uh, t striking of the asteroid, which the Alvarez asteroid, which kills out all the dinosaurs, changes the climate, and allows lemmings to evolve as primates into human beings. Uh, it looks like th that happened because of a fluctuation, a consistent fluctuation in our galaxy every 30 million years of dark matter. And so not only are we here and are we structured and we are exactly the same, but even in the details of the specificities of this one small planet in the galaxy and its behaviors traces to these large structures. Now, all I'm saying to you is what's this idea that the world is always complete. Okay, thank you for that. You can cut it off now. Um, obviously, I'm not saying that uh, the recessional object in, in triple O is dark matter. What I'm saying is two things. One is that there has to be some transmission of signals mm -hmm. somehow or another, mm -hmm. and that those signals are not just transmitted to its um, uh, cousin, but they're transmitted to everything. In other words, what so? Instead of a, the flat ontology being one ontology, the flat ontology being an ecology, a flat ecology of multiple irreconcilable ontologies is because of the promiscuity of the signals. Um, that's what I would say. And so the analogy is simply, I think you're absolutely right, but I think triple O, uh, the, the world of triple O, it's not a second reality. I mean, it's not a dialectic subject object. It's in the world as the world. It makes objects be exactly like objects. It means the world is always complete, but it has nothing, it's nothing like them. Um, and so that's what I'm proposing to, we'll take with us till next year and we'll, okay. we'll explore that. Time. And we'll, when we look at some individual objects and art objects and stuff, I'll, we'll try to see if sure. I can make this work. Thanks. Yeah, enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.